Hi. Quick, give me an everyday activity. Okay, I'm on my way to get my ears pierced. This is gonna be great. I've been waiting this for this day since I was 10 years old. Okay, let's see here. We got some star-shaped ones. We got some dangly ones. I don't like those as much, but here. Ooh, these purple ones. That's the ones I'm gonna get. Okay, okay. I got my ears pierced now. <laughs> You're probably wondering what I was just doing. That's called improv. It's a type of theater in which the actors have to work together to act out a scene or solve a problem with little to no preparation. Seems weird, right? I mean, who would want to get up on stage in front of a crowd with no idea of what they would be doing? I'll admit, I've had those thoughts. But that all changed a few summers ago when I went to a summer camp for academically talented youth called Young Students Summer Program. In this program, students get to choose a subject that isn't normally taught in school and spend a week learning about it with like-minded peers at a local campus. I had gone twice before, but both times I found I wasn't doing something I was passionate about. That summer, however, I scoured the class list, determined to find something that I would continue to be interested in once I left camp. I stumbled across a class called Improv and Creative Problem Solving. This intrigued me. Improv was something completely and totally foreign to my tiny, introverted, 12-year-old self who didn't necessarily enjoy being in the spotlight. So, as I walked into our wide open classroom, almost like a stage, really, on the first day, I was nervous. But what I saw pushed away any negative feeling I had. I saw a group of kids just like me. Kids who were shy around new people. Kids who hadn't quite yet found their voice or their passion. Kids who were determined, intelligent, hilarious, and yet no one knew it because they were too shy to let it out. Improv changed them. Improv changed me. Throughout that week, we spent our time debating who should be president of the Butter Club, interviewing an expert on giraffes who insisted that they were short, squat, and blue with purple spots as well as watching a rowdy young boy demand a coupon from a police officer. We would play games where we would have 60 seconds to figure out how a soup can could destroy the galaxy, or to explain to our manager what our job was without saying it outright. Throughout that week, I unknowingly learned several crucially important life skills, all by playing a few games. Since all of the games required us to improvise, the first thing I learned was how to think on my feet. No matter your walk of life, you will, at some point, be caught unprepared. I might learn last minute that there's an assignment due the next day. A mailman's truck might break down. A CEO might learn that her company is nearing bankruptcy. A teacher might have to rewrite his lesson plan after his class consistently scores low on tests. Or a chef might have to make do with the ingredients she has after a shipment has been delayed. Whatever the case, all of us will have to think in our feet, to make something up on the spot, to improvise. However, there is a difference between just making something up on the spot and actually producing a spur of the moment solution. You need to be able to take all existing factors and make a solution that fits those constraints. The principle that allows improv artists to do this is called yes and. Yes and is one of the first and few rules that all improv artists must learn. It teaches them to build on the ideas of others. For example, my improv troupe and I were doing a skit one time when we had to plan a birthday party. And one person decided we would have a squirrel themed party. Another person said, yes, and our cake will taste like acorns, which built on the original idea and kept the story moving. But then another person said, I thought we were having a cat-themed party, which detracted from the original idea and made the story less focused. This is just one example of how yes and allows creativity to flourish, which leads me to my next point. Improv teaches people how to be creative, especially in situations that call for thinking outside the box. In my experience with comedic improv, it is the lines that surprise the audience the most otherworldly, outrageous, unimaginable ideas that leave the greatest impression. 
By using yes and to brainstorm, you get a broader spectrum of ideas to begin with, making it easier to create artwork, problem solve, and leave a positive impression on others. Another lesson that we improv artists must learn is that it is not our jobs to make ourselves look good, but to make others look good. This is the mantra of any improv troupe, and it is another reason why yes and is so important. By using yes and to add on to others' ideas, you accentuate their ideas while still adapting and changing them. This type of creation, where everyone adds to and adapts a central idea, is termed co-creation, and it is another fundamental idea of improv. Imagine every school project you've ever done where you've had to research a topic of your choice. Every meeting you've ever been to where you and your colleagues have thrown around ideas for a new financial tactic. Or every time you and your peers have gone together for an hour or two and just thought of all the what ifs that could apply to a situation. All of these are examples of co-creation. Co-creation is so important, in fact, that companies like Google and Apple use it to solve most of their problems and brainstorm their products. So not only co-creation, but improvisation and making others look good rely on the concept of yes and. I've shown you how yes and has changed my life, but how do we know that it will improve everyone's life? After all, everyone is different, so your experience with improv will likely be very different from mine. Funny thing is, improv relies on people being different, as it allows each member of the group to bring something new to the table. Also, by doing improv, you begin to understand all these new benefits that people bring. This gives you new ways to approach tasks, as you begin to understand the different ways that people think. This lets you learn new ways to problem solve. So even people who aren't necessarily interested in a creative field benefit from doing improv. Thus, many different types of people experience similar, if not the same benefits that I did after doing improv. The Second City Guide to Improv in the Classroom by Catherine S. McKnight and Mary Scruggs is a guide for elementary and middle school teachers that provides improv activities that can actually be used in the classroom. McKnight and Scruggs argue that when you use improv to teach elementary and middle school students, the result is that they learn how to better function as part of a group and how to be more abstractly creative. Teaching kids improv at a young age gives the shy, quiet ones a chance to speak, while teaching the more assertive ones to take turns in the spotlight. This leads to more co-creation. An added bonus is that the students get a better feel for the material that they are learning while still taking control of how they learn it. For example, if a group of eighth graders are studying marketing techniques, they could do an improv activity in which they have two minutes to pitch a made-up product to the audience. A paper by a group of pharmacists from the University of Arizona shows that when pharmaceutical students practice improv together, the result is that they learn how to better communicate with patients. The study focused on two groups of pharmaceutical students in the same program studying the same material. The only difference between the two groups was that one practiced improv alongside their normal studies, while the other didn't. The group that practiced improv learned how to communicate with patients better. In fact, their standardized test scores centered around communication rose by about 20%. The reason that communication is so important not just to pharmacists but to medical professionals in general is that they need to be able to effectively communicate with their patients. By having strong communication skills, they are able to stay calm during an unexpected or stressful counter with their patients and effectively convey their message. Other studies show that people who have an autism spectrum disorder or a form of Alzheimer's also benefit from practicing improv. These studies center around the idea that when you expose these people to the randomness of everyday life in a closed environment, they are better able to handle these situations in the real world. The common theme in all of these stories, including mine, is that improv teaches people how to be confident. By practicing improv, the shy elementary school kids like me finally got enough courage to share during show and tell. The pharmaceutical students learned not to be caught off guard by questions they hadn't heard from patients before. And the people with autism or Alzheimer's 
finally learned how to communicate with the rest of us, even if it might be more difficult. Every single one of us already has amazingly creative ideas. It's just that they usually go unspoken, oftentimes because we are afraid of what other people will think. Out of all of its benefits, improv teaches you how to be confident, which allows you to push aside the fears that were once holding you back. Then you can go on and share your ideas with the world. So the next time someone asks you if you would like to go see an improv troupe, simply respond, yes, and it might lead to something greater. Thank you.